Very good. Uh, let's make a start on, uh, on this session, which is about, uh, it was going to be entitled The Vision for Data Science Education. I've actually metamorphosized it a little bit into our vision at Wolfram in terms of global education reform, sort of vision, progress, and plans. And I want to cover a slightly wider swathe of, uh, uh, of discussion than I was planning to cover um, a little bit, well, I guess, when I made up the title. Um, so let's start by you know, saying something that has become more evident to me over the last few years, which is that Wolfram, in some form, is kind of at the center of STEM education from every angle. And, you know, it's kind of like you start to think, well, there must be lots of people in the world who can do this thing or that thing in STEM education. And in many cases, you come down to the thing that actually there are very few and that we're kind of at the center of it. And if we don't do something, then nobody will. And so, we've kind of come to this realization that there are a whole collection of things that we're very much in the center of and that uh, we need to pick carefully what to do, but basically that that's a, a, you know, a, an important position we have which we want to exercise uh, well for everyone. And so what do we mean by this? Well, I think we've got great technology uh, which allows educational things to be built very well, and I think we've also got two strategies around the curriculum, and I want to separate those two. Uh, you know, so we need to kind of, you know, th there's, there's a problem with particularly math curricula, and there's a new emerging coding curricula, and those two underlie most of what's in STEM education in terms of math and coding and being able to put things technically. And we kind of have the best support for leading replacement for that in terms of technology. Um, and so really what I want to talk about in this, I think there are sort of various topics one can cover. There's coding, there's assessment, there's modern delivery of traditional maths and of new maths, and then there's computer-based maths, which is the direction I've pioneered in trying to fundamentally change the curriculum. So the way to think about this is it's kind of like um, there are, you know, there are kind of two directions, really. One is, how do we best use our technology to do the best we can with traditional curricula? And then there's the longer, medium to longer term vision of how do we switch to push the right curriculum around the world, which I don't think is what we've got. And I want to spend a good fraction of this talk talking through why I don't think we've got that right curriculum and what we can do to fix it. Some of you may have heard some of this before in terms of computer-based maths, but I'm hoping also to give some update on where we've got to with that initiative. So, but let me set down the, the sort of argument for why we need a fundamentally transformed curriculum. Well, the good news, if you're interested in math, or maths, is that math is now high on the agenda in most developed and even in developing countries. So if you look back 20 years, political agendas had less about math in them. And so, in a sense, there's a, a fair amount of pressure building on how do we improve education for math. Um, the bad news about it is that most of what's being discussed, in my view, is about 80% the wrong subject. So it's like there's this thing called math that's being discussed, and being discussed a lot, and people think it's very important to do something about math, but they also are discussing, or they're vague or muddled, or it's confused what exactly they're discussing. And 80% of it seems pretty much wrong. And so what's wrong about this? So I think there are the two subjects named the same thing. The one in the outside world that most of you are very involved in is the subject where most of the time we're abstracting problems and setting up problems and getting computers to calculate the results. Most of the time in education, we are spending getting students to learn how to calculate results themselves and not use a computer. So there's the fundamental difference. 80% of the time in education is used learning how to hand calculate, whereas almost all the time in the outside world is learnt or is used with mathematics, trying to use the mathematics with whatever's the best machinery actually to calculate the result. So, we fundamentally have a problem of, you know, there are two maths going on, and they're discrepant, 
And until that bridge, that chasm is bridged, we aren't going to have success in math education. So in order to understand what's really going on there, let's ask a few questions. Let's zoom sort of back out and ask a few questions. Why is everyone in the world supposed to learn maths? Right? There are very few subjects in this category. I mean, your own language is a subject usually in that category. History, perhaps, is a subject in that category. But many other subjects have far less presence in curricula than maths. Why is that? Well, I think there are three good reasons to learn the right subject of maths. First is technical jobs that have driven and are continuing to drive our economic development. Secondly, it's what I would call everyday living. Just to survive and know what's going on in the world, you've got to be much more quantitative than you were even 15, 20, 30 years ago. And thirdly, it's what I might call logical mind training, thinking about you know, ways to analyze things in life. They may be explicitly mathematical things or they may not be. You know, how do you think about business problems? How do you think about you know, solving social problems? It's very good to have a logical structure to think about these things. And maths has been an incredibly powerful system of problem solving through the ages. And knowing how that system works and being able to apply it in different circumstances seems extremely useful. So those are three reasons why the right subject of maths seems to me justifiable for a broad swathe of, of our societies. What is maths? Well, I think it's a four-step process of problem solving. So step one, you're defining questions. If I talk for too long in this room, we seal the room and we stop the air conditioning so there's no air going in and out, how long can we all survive? Okay, that's a question. And we're turning, we're defining that question in a sense. The next step is you want to translate that question to math. Why do you bother to do this? Why don't we just discuss the question in English? Well, because math is very precise. And if you abstract it to math, people for hundreds of years have worked out that if you take a whole series of problems that sound different in English, they can actually be the same basic problem in math. Let's say they're an equation and you need to solve the equation. So abstraction, step two, is absolutely critical. Step three, you're taking that question and turning it into an answer, still in the abstract form. So question three is step three, you are essentially computing. And step four is you're taking that answer in abstract form and you're turning it back to answer the question in words. How long can we survive? If the answer comes out as minus 19, we probably got something wrong and we have to go around it again and figure out what we got wrong. So, you know, if minus 19 hours was how long we could survive, there's a problem in the calculation. But one way or another, you've got to go through that sort of problem-solving process. And the problem right now is pretty simple to describe. We're spending almost all our time in education doing step three by hand. And that's drowning out these other steps. And it's almost, you know, it's, it's actually taking away effort from these others. And most of the other t rest of the time in real life, you're doing steps one, two, and four. So we should be using computers primarily to do step three. And we should be using students primarily to do steps one, two, and four. And I mean, just to be clear about this, right now in most maths education, you know, the teacher defines the book or the teacher or the curriculum defines the question. The teacher then tells, often does the translation to maths. So, you know, here's the quadratic equation. You go off and solve it, right? That's what you're normally given. The student computes the answer, and then usually maybe there's a little bit of interpretation at the end, but it doesn't usually tie back to any question because they don't know what the original question was anyway. Now, I mean, this is a process that, just to be clear, you need to go through several times sometimes. You know, you need to go through defining, translating, question. Eventually, after several rounds of this process, you, sometimes you get to your, your result. So math, in my view, is a much broader subject than calculating. And by the way, while we're about it, STEM is obviously, by definition, a broader subject than math. Pure mathematicians sometimes try and claim that math is the calculating. But you've got to be very careful if you're a pure mathematician claiming that. Because if you're claiming that, then I think you end up, if you work through the logic correctly, in claiming that math is a very side subject. And um, it's sort of important to understand the difference. So, so let me just give you a very simple example I often give here. This is an example that many people have to do in school. You know, how, can you solve a uh, 
set of linear simultaneous equations. But it's very odd. If you stick a cube in here and you get an answer like that, right, they don't usually do that in school. <laughs> but it's the same thing. Conceptually, it's the same thing. You know, the fact is my problem may have ended up with an equation with a cube in it, or it may have ended up with a linear equation. Who cares? Why are we limiting people only to things that happen to have nice calculating? That seems nuts. And in fact, it even gets worse than that, right? Because as you know, I can um, go and talk to my, uh, my, my phone if it's, uh, I'm not sure it's on the network. Let me try this. Solve x cubed plus 2 equals 2y, and y minus x equals 5. And sort of Siri willing, uh, we may be able to, uh, not so good. I think I'm out of network here. But anyway, you guys know the, uh, know what's going on here. Um, let's see. X minus, oh, I see what's happened here. Um, well, anyway, I, for some reason, Siri seems to have kicked it out. But anyway, I mean, the point is, you know, I can talk to my phone, as you know, in 20 seconds usually. It's on the network. And um, I can do the same thing and get the answer. And you've got to ask, you know, if I can talk to my phone in 20 seconds and get it to solve a problem that most people after 12 years of math education can't solve, why the hell are we teaching them that? Why is that what we're focused on? It seems absolutely nuts. It doesn't seem to do anyone much good. So one of the other problems with current curricula is that they're what I call mechanics-centered. So they're worrying about what's inside first. You know, can you invert a matrix? Can you simplify thirds? Can you use the chain rule? What I think curricula ought to be focused on is problems. What's the actual problem you're trying to solve? You know, design a currency. What coins and notes do you need? You know, make a perfect password for your login, right? That's a problem of any six or seven-year-old. How do I stop my friends breaking into my computer? Right? That seems like a modern problem. It's not that, you know, what's a beautiful shape? That's a perfectly valid question. I mean, the Greeks thought about that. It's a perfectly valid question. It's fuzzy. Much of maths, many of maths questions are fuzzy. Half the difficulty is in taking the fuzzy question and turning it into the abstract question you can actually use math to help. And part of the problem normally if you try and do that is that you can't do that if you're limited to only linear equations because the, the problems just didn't end up as linear equations. So your math is then useless. So one of the things I believe strongly is, I mean, I wrote this little sort of summary of the logic that I have. If you believe math is for all students, that kind of implies that math in education needs to be approximately identical to math in the real world. Because otherwise, I don't see how you can justify it for, real, for students. I mean, why should everyone be learning this if that most people have no use for it, right? And that implies that math in education should be something like computer-based maths, which is what I'm talking about. Now, if you take the corollary of that, you know, it doesn't, it, it's, uh, you know, one of the problems right now, I think, is that math is a kind of a proxy for math in education. Most people who disagree with this position do agree with me about one thing. They say, yes, you're right about how real math is in the real world. You're right. Computers do most of the calculating. The thing is, we think we should be teaching something totally different to people in education. So I say, well, hang on just a moment, but why do you start from the idea of a proxy? I mean, you're agreeing with me it's a proxy, but why do you think it's better to teach people something different to start with? Now, maybe they have a good argument for that, but they've got to first admit that what they're teaching is not the main subject. The main subject in the real world is discrepant from that. And um, I mean, it's actually uh, uh, one of the ways I sometimes summarize this is to say, you know, current math is a bit like ancient Greek, right? I mean, I learned ancient Greek at school, and it's a very fine specialist subject. And if you enjoy ancient Greek, it's a great thing to learn. But I wouldn't force the entire world's population to learn ancient Greek for 12 years of their life. It just doesn't seem something you can justify. Now, another thing that's interesting about proxies is Latin. I don't know in which of your countries Latin was taught and is still taught as a general purpose subject. But years ago, certainly in Britain, Latin was a pretty general purpose subject. It was clearly a proxy for something. Even in Britain, people didn't go around talking Latin to each other. So the question is, why were they learning Latin? Well, I think the reason was probably, one of the reasons was to teach them English grammar. 
One of the amusing things we used to have in our European office is that if we wanted to know about English grammar and we had anybody from outside England there, we would go and ask them about the English grammar because nobody in England had actually learned English grammar. Um, we weren't taught it. We were taught, if you were lucky and you go to a fancy school, you were taught Latin, otherwise you kind of learned nothing about English grammar, right? So maybe Latin is a good proxy for English grammar. I think there's some justification. It's actually not a bad proxy for English grammar, but let's be honest about what it's for. Math seems an awfully poor proxy, educational maths for the real maths right now. It doesn't seem to be enthusing people. There's little justification for much of it. It's really hard to justify. So I think, but let's be, let's be clear if we do believe it's a proxy why we're doing it. Now, how does math and coding relate? I think math is a system for doing STEM and life. It's a problem-solving system. And I think coding is a way you express math. The question is, if you're going to write down some abstraction, how do you write it down? You could write it down in math notation, but that's very limiting. You can't write processes down. You can't write algorithms down very well there. In the modern world, in a sense, the, the modern notation is code. And it, or you could argue the other way around. You could argue that math notation was one of the first coding languages, but a rather incomplete one. But one way or another, you've got to write stuff down. So I actually do think coding is a very central part of math education. And insofar as uh, governments are understanding the need to teach coding, I think that um, uh, they actually have not understood how important it is and have understood it slightly wrong. Of course, it's great in Wolfram language because stuff is quite literate and you can, you can do things well. Now, here's the key thing that I think it's worth understanding. And people, th this is a fascinating thing to me and how political decisions get made sometimes. But if you ask a politician, so, why do you think maths is very important? They'll tell you because it's, it's important in many subjects, in many areas of life, you know, in our economy and everything else, right? And say, so, yep, I agree with you there. Um, the, thing you, the thing then is you, you find out, well, so what happened 100 years ago? Maths was much less on the agenda then. Why? Well, because it didn't work very well. The reality is math worked well for things like physics, you know, planets, as I mentioned this morning. It didn't work well for a huge range of other things for which we now take maths for granted. Why didn't it work well? It didn't work well because we didn't have mechanized computation. There are a bunch of areas of maths that simply only work with mechanized computation. You know, most of the areas of biology, anything to do with large data, you know, images, all of these things are purely to do with mechanized computation, being able to do the amount of calculation you need. So most of the areas in which politicians believe math should be being applied and drive our economy are areas that cannot exist without mechanized computation and didn't. So therefore, if you remove the computer from math education, you are removing most of the context. You can't do the biological problems. You can't do the data science problems. You can't do the image processing. You simply can't do any of these things because they can't be done without mechanized computation. So therefore, what you're doing is you're stripping most of the context that you actually need for real math out of the math curriculum. This is kind of crazy. But most, and, and the thing that you're not stripping out, this is the other thing, is you're not stripping out conceptual understanding. The fact is, in the outside world, it's hard, as you all know, to apply math and get good, re important results out of it. So therefore, what you're not stripping out if you do it right is the thinking. You need humans to think more for this kind of math in the real world than you do to manage to know the formula for solving a quadratic equation. So those are things which get very muddled up in discussion about this. So, you know, it's important when you're thinking about these things to think about how you can reorder things in the curriculum. I mean, why don't we teach thermodynamics in primary school? I mean, there's a lot you can understand by looking at the math of what's happening and just uh, going through analyzing these things. And, you know, you can see all oh, their transitionary effects. That's kind of cool. What happens when you make the box smaller and the temperature higher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are lots of things you can do if you don't have to explicitly now do the calculations. Here's an example I like to show. And in this uh, example, what we did was to split classes up in, in uh, you know, in two, and we told half the class, I want you to toss a coin and to write down heads or tails with the actual results, and the other half, we want, we're going to let you just type stuff into the computer, essentially to cheat, okay? 
And what we're then going to do is feed both sets of results into the computer and see if the teacher can tell who's cheated. Well, it's pretty interesting. So I've just typed these in. And if we look at the results, you'll see that actually I only passed one of the five tests. We can pretty definitively say I was cheating. But if indeed I tossed the coin, and in fact I'm going to cheat, I'm going to semi-cheat, because I'm going to do um, random integer, let's say on uh, one, and I'm going to do it, to, let's see what we need, 200 times. So I'm going to take, uh, so I'm sort of going to use, I'm going to semi-cheat by using Mathematica's uh, um, uh, uh, random number generator. And um, uh, let's, uh, let's copy those in, uh, the ones and zeros instead of heads and tails, but I think it'll still manage it. And um, if we look at the results, it passed all five tests. And that's amazing. We can use data analysis to figure out whether somebody's cheating. Actually, that's what people do with credit card detection in a more sophisticated way. You know, have you, somebody misusing your credit card? So that's a real insight there, right there, which you could never do without uh, mechanized calculation in any serious way. That's real math in action, but used in education. So one thing I want to be clear about, there are two ways to, I mean, two sets of ways in which you can think of applying computers in education. And they are different and discrepant, and one kind of needs to understand the difference. One is computer-based, one is computer-assisted. So what I mean by computer-assisted is use the computer to improve the pedagogy of learning. Now, there's clearly lots that can be done, right? I mean, the idea of a teacher standing in front of a classroom, you know, talking with a chalkboard clearly could be improved in many, many, many ways. And it's out of date in all sorts of ways. Um, but that's true of every subject, you know, whether the history or English or, you know, or maths. Clearly, there are improvements in the system of pedagogy. Computer-based, by which I mean take the subject in the real world and turn it into an educational subject. Computer-based maths is about the fact that maths changed as a real subject. The subject changed, not just the way you teach it, the subject. And so when we discuss this, when I'm talking about computer-based maths, I mean take the subject change and move it into education. Obviously, in order to deploy that well, you need some computer assistance to actually make that work. It doesn't make much sense having chalk on a chalkboard if you're discussing a computer mechanizing computations. Okay, so that's the vision. Let me talk a little bit about the elements of making this change. First thing we gotta do is the vision for the right subject, and this is tough. I've been going on this hard for five years, and you know it is slowly getting through in various places that maybe the subject of maths is actually not quite the right subject, and we need to rethink it. There isn't this God-given subject called maths that never changes. The next thing which is difficult is to build the right subject. What do you actually want to build? And what bits of maths are we talking about? So, you know, one of the things to do is to, to try and define outcomes. It's a fairly shocking discovery of, that, at least I believe I've made, that going around the world to try and find the list of outcomes of what people want from the 12 years of maths, you come up with really some pretty lame stuff. I mean, as in, people say, we want critical thinking. Well, sure, but what does it mean? And at the other level, most of these curricula say, now it's very important that people know how to put ticks on bar charts. And it's like, well, maybe, but it seems like there's a level in the middle of those two which is sort of missed. So we've been trying to work out what the outcomes should be for math education. And we have this sort of 10-dimensional list. And there's some pretty interesting steps. And in, you know, some of it is about the actual concepts inside an area like statistics. Uh, you know, ability to describe the concept, um, interpreting the measures and computational results and so forth. Some of it's about, you know, actually running the process. You know, can you plan and run a problem-solving process with maths? Can you actually get to an answer? Do you know the management of that? That's an important part of using math. So there are many sort of dimensions to this which one needs to think about. You know, which bits of maths? How do you build the narrative around this? So another thing of making the change is to align assessment. We have not done that much work on this yet, and I think this is an area that needs a lot more effort. It's pretty clear that in most parts of the world, people teach maths to assessment. 
And the assessments are kind of goofy in most places. You know, can you do this long division by hand? That's not really testing. And they, some of them claim to be problem solving. Some of the better ones claim to be problem solving, but the problem then is, if you're limited to doing problem solving by hand, there aren't many problems you can solve, and they're not the problems you meet in the real world. If you end up with a million data points, and the question is, how do you analyze those million data points? You know, in the end, that's a completely different question in practice to here are five data points, now plot them on a graph and fit a line through them, right? That's just a different set of problems. And if you test people on how they can draw a graph with five data points, you aren't testing them on what they actually need to do with a million data points. So there's a, there's a problem of aligning assessment. And I think over time, uh, you know, this will change, but that's kind of a slow process in most places. And I think one place to start that is where adults are concerned, because adults are, you know, not regulated by, as much by governments. And so, therefore, you can actually make changes where people want to get their own, um, their own qualifications. So another thing is fixing what I call math marketing, right? Math marketing around the world from education is pretty terrible. And it's a mixture of confusion by most, I mean, most politicians in the world who run this stuff are non-technical. So they didn't really like math themselves. They didn't really understand it. And they're then in a situation of trying to tell everyone it's good for them. Uh, it doesn't work too well. Um, I mean, an example from England I was like, you know, uh, is where they insisted long division was a very important thing for everyone in primary school to know. Now, whether or not you agree with that, and I certainly don't particularly in that case, but it's terrible marketing. It's like you're telling people who go through primary school, the most exciting thing that the government's decided to highlight about primary maths is that you can do long division. This doesn't seem like a great recipe for enthusing people. And it's even worse. They do it because they think that some, some parents will be very excited about forcing their kids to learn this. And maybe there are some parents who want to you know, get out a whip and whip them into doing long division. But I think the number in most places is actually rather small compared to the number who just like their kids to know how to function well in the, in the real world. So there's a real problem with sort of uh, math marketing. And I think part of that is presenting exciting things you can do with math, things that are fun, like cheating and playing games and, you know, making sure you can outdo your parents and things like this. Um, and I think these are all sort of... Uh, um, um, in, important things. So we've been trying to improve the way in which we present some of the issues around maths, and I don't know if we've totally succeeded with that, but I think we've got some sort of message um, around. So another problem in making a change like this is you've got to mesh with today's educational environment. Um, you've got to train teachers, you've got to get expectations and skills and delivery right and confidence. Confidence is really important. You've also got to get technology that works, and you've got to set up schools and so forth. And that's the reality. One of the problems in these discussions is that people get so obsessed with the reality of what they have to do next term or next year that they completely forget the vision. The vision just sort of flies out of the space. And so you end up with a zero vision process. And in fact, I wrote a blog post about evidence and the role of evidence last week on my personal site because I realized that often when you talk about evidence-led education reform. What it means is, I mean, it doesn't mean randomized controlled trials. I mean, the good thing, I think, in using evidence is make, you know, guess. You guess what you want to do. You build the thing. You then test it. And you then see whether it seems to work better or against criteria. What happens with drugs? What evidence-led education has typically meant is you're not allowed to build anything unless you can prove that it fits with educational evidence from the past, right? That is not the way innovation can ever happen in any serious way. Incrementally, it can happen, but no big innovation can ever happen if that's what you believe has to happen first. Then, indeed, it doesn't work anyway. Any innovation around the world in anything outside education or in won't work if you assume education always um, has to be led by the evidence of what's happened in the past. And there's a great Feynman, the physicist Feynman, has a very nice bit when he's explaining how science works, um, which I, I quote in that blog post, which is kind of nice. So what's our progress? Well, we founded computer-based maths a number of years ago for this. And I think we are seeing, in some countries, the discourse changing. You know, there is a start to people questioning the subject. We started building a curriculum, and we're making some quite good progress with that. 
And I think we've built a whole bunch of frameworks around that as to, you know, how do you think through what should be in a new curriculum? How do you think through what's real and what isn't real? What order things should go in? We haven't succeeded everywhere there, but I think we have succeeded a long way. I mean, the thing I would say, and, and a lot of those are things like activities, chapters, topics, modules, and modalities are the sort of framework elements that build up um, computer-based maths. Modules are, in a sense, the set of problems that people want to solve, and these are the ways that, that they get solved. Uh, our first major place is Estonia, where we have implemented a pilot probability and statistics curriculum. I'm pleased to say the, the group from Estonia is here, um, which is great, who's been working um, very much on this. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll be happy to talk to anyone else from other countries who has, uh, have uh, questions about it. We've also made an early start in, in Sweden and Africa on changing some of these things, and there's interest from many other countries around the world. It's slow going to get these things to happen because governments and things move slowly. Things in education in general move very slowly. Um, but I think we are, we are making very good progress, and some of the technology at this conference will uh, improve that quite a lot. So what do we have to do? Well, we've got to do the rest of the math curriculum. I think math, one way to think about maths, I mean, there are various ways to categorize it. I think there are sort of five categories we need to hit. There's data science, probability and statistics and data science. There is geometry, which I think is a modern area. There's modeling. Uh, there's what I would call uh, architecture of math, which is kind of the underlying structures that you need to know. Uh, and there's a fifth one that I have lost for the moment, but it's there somewhere. It'll come back to me in a second. Anyway, there are five uh, image processing. Signal processing was the one I was looking for. And so these are sort of major modern areas of math. Maybe there's some others that you can suggest as well. And I think that's sort of part of what I reckon we've probably built 15% or so of a curriculum. But, and probably we've done 25% of the work in some ways, at least to get that going. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more work to do and a lot more sets of things to, to set up. Another thing to do is we need to consumerize. So what I mean by that is we need to set things up so that you don't need to have trained teachers for many, many hours to be able to deploy this. You can have students do a certain amount of it by themselves. You can have, you know, homeschoolers in the U.S. do this, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's an important part of trying to get change to happen from the ground up. And, of course, assessment. There's also coding education. Now, a lot has started up on this, quite nothing to do with us. But I still think it suffers in many ways from, from the problem that if you're already interested in coding, it's helpful. If you're not interested in coding, it hasn't quite hit the mark yet. But the fact that coding is being discussed a lot around the world is, is really useful, I think, to driving this. And we have started with our own idea of how to do this with Programming Lab. Uh, you know, I don't think this is a fully fledged concept, but I think it's a way to ease people into learning the idea of, of coding and particularly with Wolfram language. So I want to switch gear for a moment and just say, so I've been talking about computer-based maths and fundamentally changing the subject in the curriculum. Um, it's okay, I said I would overrun by about 15 minutes. So uh, that's, that, that, was, uh, uh, that, that was the plan. Um, the, uh, um, the, um, okay, so, so the supporting the current math curriculum. You know, we have many new technologies that can do well with the curriculum you currently got. And there's no reason not to use those. Just because we haven't got a completely revised curriculum doesn't mean we shouldn't use the technology we've got. I think these are lots of things. How to present things, productization of uh, of what we've got, MOOCs, but MOOCs which actually do things, you know, where you've got CB, uh, um, CDFs and so forth, problem generators. There are many, many things you can do there. The, uh, one of the things that I said at the beginning is I think we're in a sort of a unique position. And we've kind of been 25 plus years as the math company. And the question is, how do we best leverage that position to, to move forward? It's kind of interesting to look back 25 plus years to the launch of Mathematica, because I found this quote from Steve Jobs at the launch of Mathematica, which in a very Steve Jobs way is a rather clean vision, which isn't too far away from this. 
Now, Mathematical revolutionized the teaching and learning of math by focusing on the prose of mathematics without getting lost in the grammar. So in a rather different slice, but similar way, I think that is what we have the opportunity to do. Um, and in a rather interesting way, Jobs kind of saw that back in 88. What, um, what are we, you know, what is maths going to look in 25 years? I think the people to do a revised curriculum will see the benefits, uh, just like universal education gave the first countries like the UK uh, very great benefits from doing it first. Doesn't mean that universal education everywhere else isn't good, but it kind of helped the UK and, and other places that did it early to industrialize well and to know basically, you know, to have a greater swathe of their, uh, of, of their um, communities be able to do high level things. And I think this is, in microcosm, the same kind of change. If people can do high-level problem solving with math and with coding, they can go much further. Why now? Well, we talked about impetus. I think there's ubiquity of devices we've talked about, and also the interface is much better. In practice, it's much easier to do this than it was. So we need to stand on the power of automation, and now is the time to do that for STEM. You know, you always have a choice in education. What do you do when the world gets automated, gets mechanized? What do you do? One thing you can do is you can pretend that actually it never happened, and you can teach people how to pretend to be machines. But in the end, that always loses. You can teach people, you know, by hand how to sow seeds in the ground. But actually, if they're trying to run agriculture, that's probably not the most useful thing for them to know. And so you've got to stand on the power of the automation. That will take you further. And now we've got that opportunity for STEM. So summary, let's change the world's math curriculum over time. I think it'll take about 20, 20, 25 years. I think we're off to a good start. But let's offer the best support for today's curriculum. That's what we're trying to do. Coding is a central part of this change. And I think we've got the technology, the language, and some of the start to produce that. And, um, the question that actually has been an interesting question is a lot of people have said we should make a Wolfram assessment. But in many countries in the world, the math assessment has become so degenerate that we should actually build our own. It seems to me a horrifying prospect, but lots of people seem to want this. And anyway, I'd be interested in people's views on whether that's actually a good idea or not a good idea. I've always been trying to separate our commercial business from our education but people seem to think that that maybe isn't the right thing and that they would value a Wolfram assessment more than they value some of their local exams in their own country. And employers would too. So, thank you very much.